when October 7th happened, um, originally I was euphoric on the first day because all we knew on the first day was that the uh, a large number of Palestinians had broken free from Gaza. And there were reports that about 50 people had been killed, 50 Israelis had been killed, but there was no clarity on how. So you thought maybe it was, you know, a firefight, whatever. We didn't know. And so the first day I posted on my website uh, uh, John Brown's body, and I, because of that line, the stars above the song, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the gray, because of the line, the stars above in heaven are looking kindly down. And that line resonated for me at that moment because people had broken free of a concentration camp. But by the third day, it became clear that the picture on a moral level was much more complicated. And I found myself in a very, I would have to say, uh, I was treading on virgin territory because I wasn't confident of my moral judgment. Even though I'm a person already uh, heading towards the finishing line, most of my adult life, when it came to facts, logic, reason, I was very confident of my judgment. I had honed that skill uh, in such a way which I can say, I don't believe in false modesty, but I, I don't believe in idle boasting, but I don't believe in false modesty either, because I don't see it serves any point. Uh, I was, I, I, I was, I'm confident that I, I can go against the best and I will prevail. However, I am not confident of my moral judgment, because my moral judgment is not steeped in philosophy. It's not steeped in studying moral philosophy, and I can't make any claims to my moral judgment other than your intuitions, which everybody has, and any Tom, Dick, or Harry in the street can have as good intuitions as mine. It's just an intuition. And so since it wasn't finely honed, I had most of my life deferred to Professor Chomsky's moral judgment. I had relied on it a lot. The scholarship, I was confident on my own, but as I said, there's no direct, there's no inex inexorable uh, connection between the facts and the political and moral judgments. The first time when I disagreed with Professor Chomsky was over the question of Ukraine. And already, I have to tell you, I was very... Uh, it took me a lot of a lot of strength to do that. No, mm -hmm. it did. It did. And then the second time it came up was October 7th, except this time he was inaccessible. And so I was on my own. And I wasn't sure how to reason it through. And then at that point, I had remembered that, well, Nat Turner had killed a lot of innocents. Mm -hmm. Matt Turner went on a, he gave the order to his Confederates kill all white people. And they proceeded to do that. They broke into houses and they they did behead babies. Uh, it was quite gory and ghastly. And so, okay, now I had something analogous, though there's no evidence that Hamas beheaded the babies, but we have evidence of something, you know, some atrocities having occurred. I want to be clear about that. I do not at this point accept the fact that I do not believe it's established as a fact that babies were beheaded or rapes had occurred. The evidence on the first is zero. The evidence on the second, namely the rapes, approaches zero. Uh, so I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying we know atrocities occurred, and we knew there were atrocities that occurred with um, Nat Turner. And then I remember that when you read Frederick Douglass, you read W.E.B. Du Bois, they all held the abolitionists, white abolitionists, in the highest regard, the highest esteem. Uh, people like Charles Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens, Wend uh, Thaddeus Stevens, Wendell Phillips, and William Lloyd Garrison. 
So now my next recourse was, let's see what they had to say about Turner. Let me see how they reasoned through what Nat Turner did. And so I sat down, I looked at the Liberator, which was William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper. He began the article on Nat Turner by saying, we told you so. We told you if you treat people like this, you degrade them, you humiliate them, you lacerate them, so on and so forth. This is going to happen. He then proceeded to attack all the hypocrites, the liberal hypocrites of his day, who sang uh, paeans to the liberation struggles of the Greeks, of the Poles, of the French, but he says, fell silent among the slaves in their midst. He then says, yes, horrible things happened with Nat Turner. He says they were horrible things, but, and this is the big but, he never condemned the slave revolt. Hmm. He did not. He did not condemn what Nat Turner did. He acknowledged that atrocities resulted but he didn't say that Nat Turner was a criminal or engaged in a kind of criminal activity. He did not say that. And at that point, I was able to breathe a deep sigh of relief because that's exactly how I felt. I recognize the atrocities occurred, but I will not condemn people uh, who were engaged, essentially, what happened was a slave revolt uh, on October 7th. And if you go back, and I suspect you might have read, if you go back and look at C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins, now mm -hmm. in the course of the Haitian Revolution, <laughs> it was a killing spree on the whites. And uh, C.L.R. James says, well, yeah, maybe, it, I have it right here. Unfortunately, I have not been able to complete it because I'm going mad with the Gaza. Um, but he says, at one point, it's amusing, which is why I want to read it. After describing the horrible things that the slaves did, the killings and so forth, he writes, and yet they were surprisingly moderate. Because hmm. he says, in the course of a slave revolt, it's sort of like a flash in the pen. It happens, horrible atrocities occur, but then it passes. And he says, but compare that with the system of slavery, which doesn't pass. It endures and endures and endures over time. So he writes at the bottom, because this was, he had several editions of the book. It's a line I really savor. So he writes, and yet they were surprisingly moderate. And then the footnote reads, this statement has been criticized, period. I stand by it, period. And that's how I felt. I'm not going to budge. I'm not going to condemn them. I recognize atrocities happen, but you know, those folks, and I don't want to turn it into some sort of emotive uh, scene, but the facts are, they were born in a concentration camp. These are most of the people who burst the gates of Gaza are around 20 years old. Now, some people don't like the expression concentration camp. Well, you know where I first came across it? Uh, or I should say the earliest mention I came I, I came across. Mm -hmm. One of the monsters currently leading the Israeli government, who's quoted at some length by Bartov for his insane statements, uh, is a fellow named Giora, G-I-O-R-A, Eiland, E-I-L-A-N-D. If you look, uh, if you have a moment right now, look at the Bartov um, Yes, article. he says, he says, um... Uh, the state of Israel has no choice but to turn Gaza into a place that is temporarily or permanently impossible to live in, adding, 
Creating a severe humanitarian crisis in Gaza is a necessary means to achieving the goal. Gaza will become a place where no human being can exist. Gaza will become a place where no human being will exist. Well, in 2004, that's before the blockade. The blockade began 2006. In 2004, do you know what? how Giora Island described Gaza? He described it as, quote, a huge concentration camp. A huge concentration camp. And there are many others who have said that in positions of prominence or with authoritative, who can speak authoritatively on the subject, be it Amira Haas, who lived in Gaza and is a respected journalist and who's very exacting when it comes to the facts, or Baruch Kimmerling, who was a senior uh, so, a professor of sociology at the uh, Hebrew University in uh, Jerusalem, who described Gaza as, quote, the largest concentration camp ever. So bearing that in mind, those folks who burst through the gates of Gaza, they were born in the concentration camp. Most of them were about 20 years old. So Giora, Giora uh, Island is saying in 2004, you know? Yeah, I spoke to um, Ralph Nader earlier today, actually, and he was saying that the men chosen for the October 7th raid were in fact chosen in part because they had family members that were killed in previous Absolutely. bombings of Gaza. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure... I know it sounds like a bad B-movie script, but <laughs> Gaza has two... What's, what the people of Gaza have had to endure for the last two decades has two aspects to it. One is what you might call the flora and fauna of Gaza. Uh, when we were growing, growing up, the encyclopedia, when you would look up a country, they would have one category called flora and fauna, the mm -hmm. plant life, the animal life. So Gaza, on the one hand, it's this tiny parcel of land among the most densely populated on Earth. Nobody can go in. Nobody can go out. Um, 60 to 70 percent of the youth are unemployed. Half the population suffers from severe food insecurity. So most of the young, and most of the young men, all they have to do with their lives when they get up each morning is just pace the perimeter of Gaza. That's it. Their whole life for 20 years. There's nothing. There's, there's no past. There's no present. There's no future. So that's one aspect. But that's the second aspect. Every couple of years, Israel does what it calls mowing the lawn in Gaza. Now, there are 2.3 2 million blades of grass in Gaza to be mown. Half of those are children. Just fix in your mind the metaphor of mowing the lawn of children. And that metaphor is used all the time. People think it's cute. People think it's funny. Y you can so, hear... Yeah, you can hear a kind of edginess in the voice of folks who make this particular argument. They say, well, how could it be a genocide if Gaza's population keeps rising? And maybe this is unfair of me to project this onto them, but I hear in their voice almost like, how dare they? Like, why is the population, like contempt for the fact that there would be population growth? Because this is all ultimately a demographic game to maintain a ethno state, right? And and you hear that 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 they feel like there's a reflection between the phrase mowing the lawn and the the weird defense against it being a genocide by saying, oh, but their populations are growing. The grass is still growing, so it must not be the case that we're cutting it too much. Well, um Israel said at a certain point, Israel was admitting a caloric intake into Gaza that was just a wee bit above starvation. It was a starvation plus 
diet. So between the physical and the socioeconomic aspect of Gaza on the one hand, and those periodic mowings of the lawn where you lose a brother, you lose a sister, you lose a mother, you lose an aunt, you lose an uncle. And all of that is accumulating inside you. And then the night before October 7th, because they knew they're not going to come back. As you know, about 1,500 were killed. My estimate would probably be, since there were 250 people taken, taken hostage, probably another 500 returned, but three quarters were killed. Uh, of the 2,000, 1,500 were killed. So they knew they weren't coming back. And I could just imagine, and as I said, here comes the bad B-movie script. They kissed their mother goodbye, kissed their father goodbye. They don't pass a word about where they're going or what they're doing because it was kept incredibly secret. But the mother and father know from that kiss, something fateful is going to happen the next day. And then after kissing their parents goodbye, an inner voice speaks to them that says, tomorrow I'm going to avenge my miserable, horrible, meaningless, pointless life that was inflicted by that satanic state. And I'm going to avenge the death of my sister and my brother and my father or my mother or my aunt or my uncle. And I think some, not all, we don't know yet how many were killed in crossfire, how many were killed when Israel, when they had already been taken hostage and Israel didn't want any hostages in Gaza, so we killed the hostages with Israelis. We don't know the exact figures. But I'm not a, I'm not going to argue that atrocities occur. I think they probably did occur. It would be a veritable miracle if they didn't. You know? The question yeah, I, is I, Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm just interrupt. No, no. I wanted uh, to ask you about a couple of things you said a while back. Mm -hmm. Um for one, when you were talking about the idea of the difficulty of making a moral judgment and how it's separate from making some of these fa factual, fact-based assessments that you make in the ordinary course of things, I do wonder if there is some relationship there because I know for me personally, I mean, you, what you described was having kind of one set of facts, incomplete as they were on October 7th, that evolved uh, and your no. your moral position evolved along with the factual position. Well, on the of first learning. day, there was no moral quandary at all. If, on the first day, uh, but isn't that uh, but isn't that based on a factual presumption? You you mentioned that it seemed only about fifty people had died. It yeah. wasn't clear how whether right. it was in crossfire or the like. Right. But then, as it became clear that the situation situation was different, your opinion started to develop. And I do wonder if it's continued to develop now that there's even more reporting. Haaretz has been trying to put together a list of who was killed, some demographic information, how many children or babies were actually killed, and what percentage of those killed on October 7th were in fact military members and not civilians. The narrative, of course, has been Hamas attacked Israel to kill civilians, purposely targeting civilians. That has been part of the narrative. But now increasingly, it seems, at least from the number of names that have been um uh, collected so far, and it's a little over half at this point, I believe, about half of those names are people who are officers who, who are in the IDF, which, again, of course, doesn't minimize the tragedy of the civilian death, but does completely disrupt a narrative of targeting civilians specifically. Um, and then there's been more evidence that because of the nature of some of the damage to large structures, homes, cars, and the like, that it is likely that the IDF ended up killing a lot of its own, a lot of Israelis as well. Yes. And I think I, as I said, I don't know. And I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to speculate. I like to mm. wait uh, ex post facto 
the postmortems, read the reports, not necessarily believing every word, but uh, if it's plausible. What I would say, two, two qualifications to what you say. Number one, even though I don't always agree with Amira Haas, she is very careful and she's very exacting. And she did say around a week into uh, Oct week past October 7th, she said clearly atrocities occurred. And I respect that judgment because Amira is very precise with facts. And she knows Gaza. You know, she lived there. She knows Gaza. Uh, the second thing is Hamas hasn't denied that there were atrocities. Hamas has said it wasn't our people. Things got out of hand. There were other people who went through the gates of Gaza. I mean, it proved to be so easy to just walk through. And those uh, actions, those atrocities were carried out by others. I happen not to believe that, but that's a separate issue. I'm simply saying Hamas itself acknowledges that atrocities occurred. Uh, of course, the question of magnitude uh, comes into play at some point. But from my, from my point of view, uh, even, even if there were atrocities, I, I feel the same way as William Lloyd Garrison with Nat Turner. I, I I I couldn't I couldn't in good conscience because people don't know the history. That's the thing. Uh, people don't know the history. I'll tell you something. I sometimes tend to personalize things too much and then become self indulgent. Uh, but I'll just give you a an, an anecdote. So. I, I started documenting the Israel-Palestine conflict in 1982. When I first got involved, it was when Israel invaded Lebanon. After it invaded Lebanon, I, I have a scholarly side to me, which I can suppress. I can't just be an activist. And so I started to read up on the subject. Eventually, it became my doctoral dissertation. And then because of that breakthrough I had when I was still a graduate student and proved that a major work on the Israel-Palestine conflict, which had praise had been heaped on it to high heaven, it was a fraud, and I was credited with exposing the hoax. So then I became fully immersed in it. And for the next 40 years, that's pretty much all I did. I'll tell you, since you know Dr. West, uh, in preparation for a long interview I did with him, I started to read through his work, and I was both dazzled and humbled. Hmm. I was so humbled in at least four areas, philosophy, world literature, religion, and African-American history and culture. He's right up there with the best. And I felt really bad. I mean, I felt obviously good for him. But I felt really bad that my my range had become so narrow, and my whole life passed with that. By 2018, uh, 2019, I was getting more and more and more detailed to the point that my last book on the subject sold 374 copies. My Publish said, my publisher told me in great dismay. Mm. <laughs> so um, at that point, I had stopped studying the subject. I had switched to new areas. And I'll be honest with you, I felt mentally liberated. Mm. I was finally past the 40 year long ordeal in the desert. And now I could read literature again. I started to read African-American literature and history and so forth. Why do I bring it up? I had a three-year hiatus, 2020, 2021, 2022, until now. And then when the event started in, 20, in October 7th, I was really the only one who had published the political history of Gaza. But I had forgot already what I had written. And so I had to sit down and reread 
my book on Gaza, Gaza and Inquest into its martyrdom. And then as I start to read it, and all the lies, all the misinformation, disinformation, the twisting, the distorting, and most of the book is just forensic. It's demonstrating all the lies in hyper detail. My innards start to writhe as I again had to revisit what was done, what has been done to those God forsaken people. I speak as a resolute atheist, those God forsaken people. And yeah. once I had reread the book, there was no way on God's earth that I am going to render a moral judgment on any of those people, which I am quite certain is how William Lloyd Garrison felt. Because every minute of every day, the slavery was not you know, behind the walls of a concentration camp. It was confronting you every minute of every day as you walked down the street. Mm -hmm. He could not, in good conscience, render a harsh judgment on Nat Turner. Well, I did want to I want to did want to drill down on that point pretty quickly because I, I did want to get to responding to some clips that I uh, emailed you earlier, and that's going to take a little bit of time. But to that second point, I just wanted to say to ask you about the question of what it means to not want to condemn, because I think in a vacuum, in a safe space between like minded folks who like you and I who feel the same way about the humanitarian horror that's been inflicted on the people of Gaza and the people of Palestine, not just since October 7th, but for 75 years, we would easily and openly admit to each other uh, about our feelings of, um, how did you put it, um, atrocities having occurring is bad, atrocities are bad. Atrocities um, are killing bad. Atrocities are bad. That, is, that is not yeah. hard to admit, but there there is this interesting psychological thing that I've been wrestling with about what it means for so many pro-Palestinian advocates to be pressured into making these condemnations, the implications that are drawn from a failure to condemn, what it is psychologically in us that makes us not want to condemn things that we would easily say are wrong in private, what it is we think, how it is we think our condemnations are going to be weaponized, whether it is really just the idea that well, maybe I would be willing to condemn this op more openly if you were willing to condemn the condition of Palestinians as a forced first order problem. Um, you know, I wonder if you've given any thought to what does it mean? What does it mean to say I don't want to condemn? I would never condemn um, Nat Turner or any slave revolt, even as I acknowledge that killing babies is right. bad. For instance, okay. Number one, it's not a simple answer. And I'm not going to pretend otherwise. How do you, if you say an atrocity occurred, then obviously you have to condemn the perpetrator of the atrocity. That seems to be the logic. But that's not what William Lloyd Garrison did. If you live next door to a couple, right? And you periodically heard that the husband is beating the wife, battering the wife. You get upset by this. You occasionally see the woman. She has black and blue eyes. She's obviously being battered. You call the police. Now, you live in a different generation. In my generation, when that happened, you call the police. And you know what the police said? I'm telling you. They said, we can't interfere. It's a domestic matter. Mm-hmm. They couldn't interfere. The laws changed radically after the women's movement. It happened all the time. But you heard it. You heard the battery. You heard the screams. You heard the plaints. You heard the pleas. And there was no way to help the person, the, the woman. And then one day, you come home. And there are all these police 
outside the apartment. What happened? The woman stabbed her husband a hundred times. Hmm. Okay? And then the next morning or in the nightly news, you see all these lurid headlines. Monster woman stabs husband a hundred times. And then the reporters come over to you. You live next door. So tell us about this monster. Well, you're a little reticent, I suppose, at that characterization. And then they say, well, it was horrible stabbing him a hundred times. And you'll, you'll nod your head. Yeah, it was horrible stabbing somebody a hundred times. It's horrible. So, of course, she was a monster, right? What would you say? I mean, I'll say it's a little, it's, I, I completely, I think that's a really useful um, analogy, but I will complicate it a little because in that, in that case, someone might say, well, Norm, you're saying that he asked for it and he deserved it. And in that case, I might be willing to say, hell yeah, he, he asked for it. It was illegal. And I'm sorry, this woman's going to go to jail. And I would have advised her not to do it because she's going to go to jail and that's not worth it. But yeah, he was, he clearly deserved it. In the case of the October 7th example, you might think, well, it's, uh, you know, uh, Palestinians have a right to resist under international law, but they don't have a right to target civilians under international law. And if you're talking about a random civilian that got caught up in the October 7th melee, then I would even be much more, I would be much more reluctant to say, obviously, that they deserved it, even though the kind of justification for the act I, I, on the I, part I don't of want Hamas. To say, I don't want to use the term deserved it. That was your term. Yeah, I, but I, I I'm speaking say, for myself. Yeah, I wouldn't say deserved it. I would say it was an atrocity, but I'm not condemning the woman. Stabbing a person but do, you, but, do you, but do you see what I'm saying? That it's, I it's a little bit of a difference. That, but, you know, Brianna, Brianna, I totally respect what you're saying. And I'm not out to score debating points. I've thought it through very hard. I've thought it through. So I'm going to tell you, I'll ask you to respond. I see your point. Let's say they burst through the gates of Gaza, and then they just fled. Okay? Who's the they? The Palestinian militants. Okay. They just fled. They didn't take hostages. They didn't kill anyone. They just fled. All right? First of all, that's a betrayal of their families. They're just running away and leaving behind their family. I, okay, wait. I, I don't know that... I, I, I don't know that you're responding to my... I don't know that you've... Um, I'm, I think I'm that we might to. have a misunderstanding here. Okay, I, I, I know. I'm going to get to your point now. Uh, okay. Okay. Because I, 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 did, I didn't feel like I completely finished my point, so I'm not okay. sure that you're fully thought, responding I, to what okay, I fine. was going to say. I thought where your point was, the analogy wasn't exact because she stabbed the husband who had been brutalizing her. Uh -huh. Where in the case of Gaza... These were, quote unquote, innocent civilians. Well, some were and some weren't. Some were soldiers who are a fair game in a, in a resistance scenario. Right. And some were not. Right. And I get that. What I'm saying is, what were the options? One possibility is they just break free and run. Well, we already know what's going to happen there, because about a couple of years ago, maybe now three years, because when you get older, time really, it's very hard to distinguish numbers of years. I think about three years ago, two or three years ago, there was this incredible prison break from a high security prison in, in the West Bank. It was like something out of the Great Escape. Over many years, they used their fingers and eating implements to dig a hole. They got out. When they got out, everybody in the West Bank was euphoric. They escaped. They escaped. And you know, it's a metaphor for their own escaping. If these three folks can escape from this high security prison, maybe we can escape. So spirits were very high. What happened? Within the week, they were all tracked down and killed. 
They spend years digging those tunnels and within a week, killed. And then everybody's spirit crashed, shattered. We can't win. We can't win. So if they had just fled, every one of them would have been tracked down and shot dead. There's no doubt in my mind about that. There was nowhere to hide in Israel. It's a very organized society. You're not going to find shelter <laughs> from the Israeli military in anyone's home because everybody's the military. It's a citizen army. So they would have just been killed. In terms of trying to end this concentration camp, it would have actually been even more disastrous if they escaped and then got killed. So their only option was to take hostages if they wanted to do something that would help the struggle. Now, people don't like to hear that, okay? Taking hostages is terrible. Listen, I'm all for freeing the hostages, totally. However, and I'm not trying to be clever. I'm speaking to facts. I want those 250 Israeli hostages freed, and I want those 2.3 million Gazan hostages freed. Because that's what they are. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.